Hello, screen of starting momentarily. I'm a real person, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, hold on, everyone just, just, shh, just quiet, yeah, quiet, listen, want... listen. Don't use the same coffee button. Do you hear all the sparrows in, in your uh, background there? Yeah, it, they seem to be a little bit quieter, but it may be they seem to be a little bit quieter just because I now have earbuds in. But yeah, it, it is a, a outdoors of angry sparrows. I totally hear it. So <clears throat> I think I'll actually mention in the episode that if people hear the bird tweeting sound, that is, and Preston's going to have his work cut out for him to, uh, to, to hack some of that out. Well, we'll just leave it there. It's yeah. Good. It, it what's a few sparrows among friends. It makes it sound if you're like listening to the podcast, it'll sound like we're having like some kind of forest walk talking <laughs> about space. It's it's really kind of crazy in the evenings where, where we've had power outages and it hasn't really been quite hot enough that we've had to have the AC on. I've been opening the windows at night. And um, the thing about opening the windows at night is it's cicadas, it's frogs, it's crickets, it's uh, I we shouldn't have nightingales in this part of the country, but there's some angry bird at 3 a.m. Um, so it's 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 a cacophony, or however you say that word. Uh, cacophony. Cacophony. See, this is the problem when you grow up reading instead of talking to people. Is you you have this vast vocabulary of words you can't pronounce. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, if people have no idea what we're doing here. Um, we are going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. Today it's episode 305. Now this is another one of our catch-up episodes. And we're going to be doing another one later today, by the way. I no, we're you... not. It's not on my calendar. There's not another episode today on my calendar. Yeah, it kind of is. No, I looked. It's Wednesday. All right. Okay. Well, maybe it's two tomorrow, um, <clears throat> and seven on Friday. But um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce this as uh, Monday, May 6, twenty thirteen. But obviously that's not what today is. But boy, we're within four weeks of the actual date, and that's good. Um, so yeah. So we'll take about half an hour to record today's episode. Could you kill those birds? No, I, I I like the birds except when they're being as angry as they're being today. They're being super angry. Um, right. Okay. So we're going to uh, take about thirty minutes to record the episode, um, and then we're going to uh, yeah. stick around for a few minutes and and take some of your questions and and such about uh, about either what we talked about today, or if you want to share some of your anecdotes, or if you want to just ask us any questions about space and astronomy, we are good to go. Um, now, there's a few ways you can do that. You can post a question over on the event page if you want uh, on Google+. If you're watching this kind of in my, if it's popped up in my stream, you want to post a comment there, you can do that. Um, and then if uh, you're watching this embedded somewhere out on the internet, you can just use uh, Twitter, just use the hashtag AstronomyCast. Or, and the safest place is to watch it on YouTube, or make your comments on YouTube. So if you're watching this anywhere and you're not entirely sure your comments are getting tracked, just click to watch it on YouTube and then we will uh, we'll have that conversation. We'll have the conversation over on YouTube. And, um, and for the most part, our comments are safe. We, yeah, we aspire safe. to be no. a uh, role model to the rest of YouTube about no. how to give comments on YouTube. Yeah, nobody um, will abuse you v verbally usually. and emotionally on uh, on our shows, we hope. It's a safe place. Um, okay, cool. All right, well, let's get rolling then. Uh, anything Anything else? Um, oh, uh, announcements. We'll make another announcement for the uh, Hangout-a-thon, and I was going to mention the uh, the Universe Today, the, the videos we've been, I've been doing on Universe Today, so okay. I was going to make a mention of that. Um, did you have anything else you needed to promote? That's probably a lot. The Hangout-a-thon is, is the big, okay. big thing right now. Cool. All right. <clears throat> All right. So, ready to press record? Yep. I pressed record. I am actually in mono, and it is working so much better since Testing. I deleted 50 gigabytes yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that really helps. Uh, okay, good. I'm, I'm also recording. It seems to be working great. All right, let's get rolling. Astronomy Cast, episode 305 from Monday, May 6th, 2013. The spacecraft that wouldn't die. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of the Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evertsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? 
I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. So I just need to sort of let people know that if you hear this sound in the background, uh, that there are sparrows just outside your window. <laughs> there are. It's, yeah. it's that time of year where the baby sparrows have fledged and they can fly, but they still want mommy and daddy to yeah. feed them. So there's lots of angry, hungry baby sparrows in the eaves of our house, uh, sometimes in the siding of our house, um, yeah. being very demanding. Yeah, so it's tornadoes, it's sparrows. Yeah. Um, I think I'll take the sparrows. Uh, so, so just another reminder that we're going to be doing the Hangout a thon on uh, June fifteenth, fifteenth through sixteenth. We're starting at noon Eastern. We're carrying through midnight till at least noon on Sunday, the sixteenth, noon Eastern. Um, we're uh, working on pulling together guests. We're going to have Mad Art Lab's uh, Death by Puppets. Phil Plate will be joining us. We're going to have How to Raise Your Geeks, Susan Murph. Um, and we're even going to bring you the cast of Beyond the Wall, and we're going to try and figure out all that crazy science that might possibly but maybe not explain the weather in the Game of Thrones series. Oh, great. Finally, so, someone will answer that. Yeah, I don't know if we'll answer, but we'll try. So, okay. And you're going to be joining us with the Virtual yep. Star Party and yep. more. So yep. um, go learn more by going to cosmoquest.org slash blog. It's the latest post up at the top of the page. Um, it may start to slide down, but we will keep a link at the top of the page up until the uh, hangout. Um, we should probably record an episode of Astronomy Cast during the hangout -a we can do that. Yeah, or maybe two. One at the beginning and one at the end. Compare and contrast, Pamela's brain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We've recorded so many times when I've pulled the all-nighters. I know. I, know. I, I barely even know. Uh, so, right, so June 15th and 16th, join us on the Internet, and we will hope to entertain you and help do some fundraising for science. One other thing just to, to let you know is I've been actually recording a whole new series of short space videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, so mostly it's to learn how to do video, um, but I needed sort of some way to kind of organize my brain and, and do this. So, so there, you know, various topics, how long does it take to get to Mars, how many stars in the universe, things like that. And so if you do a search on, on YouTube for Universe Today, you should find my channel and, and I hope you it's enjoy them. It's just uh, youtube.com slash universe today. Yeah, youtube.com slash universe today. And then, and we're, I'm putting out two a week and they're just like four minutes long uh, and, and, and I what's... people like them. What's cool is you're recording a lot of them outside. Yeah. And so not only do you have great lighting, but you live in a very beautiful area of British I'm Columbia. Taking advantage of that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then one other thing, which is that you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, just just click subscribe. I'm not sure where the button is going to be, um, but just click subscribe, and so either and so that will get you subscribing. I think on the Astrosphere Vids channel, and then um, whenever if they we... do it right now, they're if they do so it right people, now, they'll yeah, it'll be on my channel. But once they're watching it over on Astrosphere Vids, then they'll yeah. sort of be connected to the Astrosphere Vids channel and get the new episodes as we release them. So, if you want to see us in video, edited. too much talk. Let's move on with the uh, <laughs> let's move on with the episode. Uh, so people always give us such a hard time. Um, last week we explored the various ways that spacecraft can die. But this week, we explore the spacecraft and the scientists who never give up, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. We'll look at clever solutions to potential spacecraft catastrophes. So yeah, last, last week, we're, it was kind of a bummer. We're just talking about, because everything dies and all spacecraft die, and, and they all have to die some way. Uh, but there are some wonderful stories of spacecraft that lived a lot longer than anybody was ever expecting, uh, repurposing these spacecraft, uh, you know, extending the missions years after anyone ever thought they would last. Crazy. Rescuing them when people thought they should be dead. Repurposing them for different missions than what was originally planned. And even, a, you know, a few situations where nature intervened so, and, and helped us out. So I think there's some great, uh, some great stories here. So, uh, so let's sort of, we're just going to pick randomly and start going through some of our favorite anecdotes here. Where do you want to start? Um... Solar Maps, I think it's sure, one of yeah. the, the early examples. I know it's one of the ones that, that I kind of grew up on because one of the early IMAX videos was um, the rescuing of Solar Max. So you got to see all the astronauts doing the walks, catching the spacecraft. And this was a, a spacecraft that um, it needed repaired. It wasn't returning data. It wasn't fully functional. 
And so they used the Canada arm on the space shuttle to grab a hold of it, bring it into the cargo bay area. Astronauts went out on, um, they, they went out and, sorry, I'm being attacked by a fruit fly. Sorry, <laughs> Preston. <laughs> Maybe feed them to the sparrows. Um, so so they, they captured the uh they captured the spacecraft, brought, brought it into the cargo bay, did a series of spacewalks, um, released it, and it proceeded to get data for years to come. And what was so the purpose of Solar Max? It was studying the sun during Solar Max. Right. Okay. So it was sort of looking at the sun during the during the a, height of its. It was a the, the solar, solar observatory. Yeah. It it had ultraviolet spectrometers. It had X-ray uh, detectors, which is something you can't do from the Earth. This was in the days before SOHO, in the days before Solar Dynamic Orbiter. Um, so this was when our one of our first on orbit really high quality, getting data from soft X-rays to hard X-rays, all the way out into the gamma rays. Um, it was capturing data we can't get on the Earth because of our atmosphere being in the way. Um, but when the sucker launched, it didn't work up to spec, and so they fixed it and made it as good as new. Or at least. So did you see that that IMAX movie, The Dream Is Alive? Oh, I saw this. Well, this this. Um, yeah, I saw this over and over and over because I was one of those kids that went to space camp and yep. my family had a uh, membership to the Boston Museum of Science. So I, I feel like I was on orbit with that crew. Um, it, it's really powerful. It's now available on video if you want to get it. So watch The Dream is Alive. Yeah. And, and now, I mean, this was, I mean, part of the justification of the space shuttle back in the the 70s, you know, at the 70s as they were designing yeah. it, the 80s as they were flying, it was that they could do this kind of thing. And I know that that some missions, Solar Max was one of these that was actually equipped with a grapple fixture. So so the space shuttle could perform this repair if as necessary. And what what's kind of awesome is they originally thought with the space shuttle that they'd be able to grab things and bring them back to Earth to fix them, which is why they had the grappling hooks. Yeah. Um, but it was realized that um, some of these things weigh a lot, and trying to land with those things in the back of the space shuttle wasn't going to be successful. And so they had to learn how to repair spacecraft that were designed for bare fingers repairs to instead get repaired by astronauts who are wearing space gloves that severely limit the mobility and dexterity of your fingers. All right, well, let's move on to another mission then. Uh, do you want to talk about Near? Near Shoemaker? You just want to jump through time. I do. Well, <laughs> was, there, was there a sort of a, a next, you know, I'm sort of, you know, me, I'm a squirrel. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, if, there's a, if you want to move to the next thing, do you have them chronologically? Well, so, no, I don't really have them chronologically, but I was just thinking conceptually, the Hubble Space uh, Telescope. Sure. All right, we'll move on to the Hubble next. So, so here we have a, a telescope, again, launched uh, such that they figured they could bring it back down to Earth to service it. It was designed to have swap out parts, um, so they basically did plug and play before plug and play existed. Uh, but um, when they launched it, it didn't work to spec. The mirror had been ground wrong. The mirror was the yeah. wrong shape. And so they were getting <laughs> images that were no better, really, than you could get on Earth, um, but they figured out how to add essentially glasses to fix the aberrations to the light, and uh, over the years they figured out how to repair these servos, which I know is your favorite thing on spacecraft. Um, they, they, they took more gyros. More yeah. gyros. Um, they, they were able to replace instruments, add new cooling, all sorts of different things over the decades that mission has been on orbit. So Hubble is a mission that over and over and over Congress tried to kill and Mother Nature tried to make non-functional. And uh, that, that's the little spaceship that people just kept taking care of and mm -hmm. kept fixing up like a my beloved old Jeep feels that way, I think. But it's not just like fixing it up. I mean, massive improvements and upgrades and new oh, yeah. instruments new and, you know, and much better camera systems. And, you know, it, you know, the most recent update 
it's a much better telescope than it was even you know the the yeah. when it was when it was repaired originally. I mean, it's yes. even though it's been wearing down and those gyros have been going like crazy. Um, you know, as long as they just keep bringing more gyros, uh, that I mean, just the, the level of science they can do. And I, you know, I know that like with some of the the more recent observations, it's amazing. They're like, we couldn't have done this before. We got this new camera on board, and now look at what the science we're able to produce. It, it's really kind of awesome. Um, the, the sadness is that with with this particular mission, eventually um, it will die through the atmosphere. So um, this is going to be a purposeful and forever kind of death versus the grab it with a robot and put it into a high orbit where maybe someday we can do something with it. Now that was a, a possibility, but they really just ruled it out. Yeah, money. Money, yeah. <laughs> Less money, more problems. Um, so right, okay. So so that's great. So then, what did we what do we put next? I see. We want to follow our list here. All right, here. Uh, no, we didn't. We've got. No. A, pick pick your next pick your next mission. Uh, how about Fuse? We'll stay in our orbit for a little bit. Sure. Let's go. To, let's go to Fuse. <laughs> so Fuse is the far ultraviolet spectroscopic explorer. This is another one of those spacecraft designed to look at the heavens in a color we can't see from Earth. And because it's a telescope, you have to have very precise pointing. Otherwise, well, you won't be looking at the object you want to look at. And since images aren't taken instantaneously, you have to maintain that pointing in order to get uh, in focus, not shifting through your field of view images. And uh, like so many spacecraft, it's it's stabilized with gyros, and um, hmm. they use gyros. Them. You say it's in this case they call them reaction wheels. Yep. Yep. Um, so it had all of these reaction wheels, and those also go into pointing the mission, steering the mission, stabilizing the mission, all of these different things. Um, but over time, they kept losing them, so they went from many to two. And you can run a spacecraft off two, um, but eventually they ended up with just one. And just one is rather limiting because that only tells you information in one of the diff three different directions you can pitch you on roll your, your spacecraft. And um, so they had to figure out what do we do. And what they figured out to do was to rely on the Earth's magnetic field. and. Um, use that magnetic field to adjust and figure out where they were pointed and keep themselves pointed accurately. So, uh, so how were they actually doing this with the magnetic field? I, there, there were basically compasses on board is the way you think about it, and uh, they just had to maintain their alignment relative to the Earth's magnetic field. Oh, so, so like, and was the compass actually pulling the whole spacecraft into alignment with the, the magnetic no, field? No, that would, that would have been useful because yeah. um, that wouldn't have taken fuel. Um, no, they, they, were, they were steering the spacecraft the way they would normally steer the spacecraft, but they were using the magnetic field to maintain the pointing on orbit. Right. You have to uh, keep track of where you are in space. But I think the the sort of the tremendous rescue with this one was that they were able to get it even with the one wheel. They were still able to keep doing science. I mean, yes. you know, normally I think they start to think they're they're going to start losing science when they go below three wheels because yes. you want those three dimensions, right? You want to be able to look in all different Pitch, dimensions. Roll and yaw. Yeah, and, and you need yeah. all three wheels. But but even with Hubble, they figured out how to use it with only two. So we're getting pretty good at figuring out how to use other information, whether it be um, making sure that you're jumping from star to star, keeping track of where the sun is, uh, making sure that one star stays on the exact same pixel throughout an entire image. Um, there's all sorts of different things that telescopes can do to maintain their pointing. And when they're on-orbit telescopes, uh, they start using extra data, including the Earth's magnetic field, to figure out where they're pointing. Right. Um, oh, I I want to throw one in as well, which is um, which is Galileo, because we, okay. we talked about that yesterday, and then we forgot to put it into the show notes. But I but I remembered. So with Galileo, right? You know, they were planning on launching it, and it was going to launch with the space shuttle. Right. Right. And then they had to repurpose its launch vehicle, and so they had to change the flight plan. Um. That that one. I that type of thing happens all the time. Um. 
things get launched, they end up in, in different orbits than intended due to missing launch windows, changing launch windows, changing launch craft. Um, so, so that one is simply math. They did math. That's okay. The, the real rescuing that happened with Galileo is uh, they couldn't get its high gain antenna working. And so yeah. they had to rewrite the compression mechanisms for the data. So they had to figure out not only how do they use a different antenna to send the data back, but um, on the fly after launch, they had to reprogram the spacecraft. And as someone who programs websites, that's terrifying. I can't imagine reprogramming a live spacecraft because if my website accidentally looks like Picasso painted it for five minutes, no big deal. If my spacecraft suddenly starts spinning like a crazy modern, I don't know, sculpture gone wild, um, that isn't good or recoverable. Yeah, I mean, I think about how you know my web server is located half a country away from me. And it, you know, freaks me out that I can't just go over and turn it off and turn it back on. But I know somebody could. That's what if the I... Amazon Web Services console is for. Yeah, no, I know. And so if, you know, somewhere in there there's a button that says, make an actual human being go over and check on my computer, I'm sure. Your um, computer isn't physical. It's no, I understand, VMware. I understand. But the point is, is that someone could start tearing out wires and make the whole <laughs> thing work again. But, but, you know, with Galileo... And and the same thing with some, you know some all these other spacecraft. In many cases, yeah. they're rebooting them, you know, like <laughs> they they had to fix a memory glitch on Curiosity. They had to fix fixing memory glitches is just kind of something that ends up happening on a regular basis. Um, yeah, so NASA programmers are terribly underpaid compared to commercial programmers. Um, but they're doing things that is magic. Yeah, in fact, you know, back in my computer days, yeah. um, the most useful documents for managing computer software projects were the ones written by NASA. And so oh, wow. I would give all of my programmers these these documents created by NASA, and they're all about sort of requirements, specs, and quality control, and things like that, and the way to actually build a software product that is you know, as error-free as possible, yeah, and robust. And so you can just imagine, I mean, because you just, you can't go over and take out a wrench and, and tweak the, the, you know, the spacecraft once it's gone. Anyway, we're, we're going, we're, div you know, <laughs> we're going down this. a rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, so let's move on then. So Galileo was great. Um, now can we talk about Near? Yes, now we can talk about Near. All right. So, so Near, uh, was I, I just lost its acronym, Near Earth Asteroid. Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous? Yes, Rendezvous Mission. Yeah. Um, it was a, a probe that went out to go see an asteroid, as the name implies, in this case, the asteroid Eros. And um, it. what I love is it had a spectrometer on board for getting a sense of what was the composition of, of Eros. And after it was done doing its planned science, they, they had a spacecraft. They didn't know what to do with it. So they very carefully adjusted its orbit from being about 200 miles away to being on Eros. They, they actually very carefully, very slowly, very gently landed the spacecraft onto the asteroid, completely unplanned. It had no landing feet. It had nothing. They just moved it very slowly. <laughs> and Eros has very little gravity, so they were able to do this. And one of my favorite uh, sentences related to this mission goes along the lines of, um, they were able to get more than an order of magnitude greater accuracy in their measures of the composition when they switched from being 200 miles away to being six inches away from the surface. <laughs> so they, they landed the mission and they kept doing science. They kept using the onboard instruments and sending data back. And eventually NASA said, okay, we really do need to shut this mission down and, and they closed shop. But a year later, someone got a wild hair to see if they could make contact with it again, but it, it hadn't continued yeah. to live. But it's amazing that they didn't just put some little feet on it and maybe, you know, a camera that could look it's, around. Like, you but, know. but the problem is that when you're designing spacecraft, your hands get tied. You get told you're only allowed to do this, you're only budgeted to do this, and you know your spacecraft to do all these other things. Yeah. And there's a lot of times where 
you'll build something purposefully flexible, knowing it meets the specs that you're required to do, but if you're lucky, you'll get to repurpose it. Yeah. These are extended, extended mission protocols. But feet, that's something we couldn't have snuck past Congress. <laughs> right. To make, you know, no, no, those are our laser range finders. No. You know? No. <laughs> it wasn't in the spec. <laughs> that's our infrared spectrograph. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, just the fact that they took that thing and, and, and there's, there's a wonderful like animations you can see of it, of it coming to the, I guess of the surface coming up to meet you yeah. and you're just seeing the, it closer and closer and closer and closer. you're not really sure how far away closer. it is until it just, well, just, you know, done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sort of like the last image, but yeah, just amazing that they, that they pulled that off. That's a, that's a classic. Oh, and, and one thing we forgot about Galileo, just to sort of jump back for one second, um, was Gal yeah, well, Galileo's final act was a piece of oh. science, an unexpected piece of science, right? Yeah, so, so as we realized more and more that, that Europa, the, the world that Isaac Asimov's novels said we are not to visit as a human race, uh, well, it turns out Europa actually just might be capable of sustaining life. And Galileo was not a sterile spacecraft. It was not one where we had done any, any care to biological hazards, really. And so there's this moment of, we don't want to inadvertently carry the moral equivalent of smallpox to Europa and kill all the life there that we have yet to discover. So rather than uh, run the risk that as the mission wound down, as it started to run out of fuel and hit its end of days, um, that it would crash into Europa, they decided to plunge it violently into the surface of Jupiter and make measurements as it penetrated down until it eventually stopped being able to send back data, probably because it got crushed by the atmospheric pressures on Jupiter. Cassini should be taking notes. Cassini should be watching its back. With yeah, us, it, its future isn't all that different. No, no, no Cassini. Because I mean, it's like all ice moons out there, right? Like, well, and no, Titan, Titan. Yeah. Methane world. Yeah, uh, Enceladus with with geysers of of water ice pouring out of the bottom of this moon. Yeah, my bets on Titan. Your bets on Titan? Yeah, methane yeah. creatures. Yeah, I'm all about that. We did a show. We did a show on that. If people want to go back, we talked about how you know the concept of astrobiology that perhaps life could use other kinds of solvents for life, and methane is one of them. So you never know. Um, so let's talk about spirit and opportunity. Okay. Yeah, because they, I mean, talk about spacecraft that just won't die, except one did. Well, yes, spirit. Spirit eventually got stuck and froze to death, but. Yeah. Um, these these were little rovers that were expected to last uh, not very long at all, and instead lasted years and years. And uh, Spirit was expected to travel, I think, 0.4 miles, um, and then instead ended up traveling miles and miles and miles as it circled uh, an area referred to as home plate and took measurements all along, dug holes as it went. Um, not holes like Curiosity digs, it, it scratched surfaces with its rat. Um, but then when it got stuck in the mud, they, not mud, uh, when it got stuck in the sand, the soft soil, they repurposed it into a stationary science platform to basically become a sky watching observatory to measure the weather, to uh, do all the things that a stationary science platform on the roof of a science building might do. And I had mentioned at the be at the beginning of the show that nature even has intervened, and this is one of the situations where where nature gave gave spirit a bit, an opportunity, a bit of a helping hand, because I know the original yes. expectation was that those solar panels were going to get choked up with dust, and then the spirit and then the the rovers would be you know wouldn't have enough yeah. power to keep themselves warm. And and instead, what they found is Mars has weather; it has gusts of wind and. Uh, while they got stuck in some dust storms, the fascinating thing about the dust storms is their flat surfaces just got blown clean in the storms. So uh, while the little rovers did get sand blasted, they didn't get destroyed in the process. Yeah, so in fact these gusts of wind and dust devils and things were actually blowing off the dust. They accumulated dust on their solar panels and giving them more illumination. It's amazing. And, and this is one of those cases where they've had to overcome memory glitches, they've had to overcome programming glitches, they've had to over, overcome 
uh, stuck wheels, uh, joints that didn't want to unfurl. Um, and, and that's in fact something that we didn't mention about Cassini is Cassini had problems where its antenna didn't want to unfurl and they had to basically jiggle it. And uh, you can send commands to essentially jiggle the antenna. What they needed to do was kick it, but there were no astronauts out at Saturn's right, orbit to right. do that. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, so I think there's two more that I want to talk about. One is epoxy. Otherwise known as Deep Impact. Deep Impact. Which is kind of the worst name they ever gave any spacecraft. Um, it's just asking to be spoofed and made fun of. But, but this is a, a mission that started out as a spacecraft and impactor, so sort of think of L-Cross where it had the impactor of the empty rocket followed by the spacecraft and then became another impactor. Um, but with epoxy, um, then deep impact, the impactor went into um, a, a comet, um, a comet Hartley, and then um, measured what it had to measure, sent back data, everything was successful other than the fact that the comet didn't form a crater the way we expected and instead just sort of had infilling snow, essentially. Um, but then they saw this working spacecraft and it was happy to keep working and it continues to be happy to be working and so they've been able to do extended missions with it where they're looking to send it to additional objects over time and continue its its original core science of looking at minor bodies throughout the solar system and this extended mission um, is called epoxy and along the way it's it's also done things um, like being used just as a regular everyday space telescope to look for extrasolar planets and so they, they keep finding new things to do with it. So it, uh, it's the extrasolar planet observation, characterization, and then deep impact. It's the two things that the spacecraft is now for. Yeah. Um, and then there's Hayabusa, which, which we had been sort of covering quite a bit on Universe Today, and it was just, again, it was like... Lost it, know, lost it, found lost, it? Lost it, found it. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so why don't you go to Hayabusa? Uh, so, so Hay Hayabusa is is a Japanese mission, uh, another one of these asteroid encounter missions, and it um, it ran into issues getting back to Earth with its samples. Um, so, so they lost communications with it. weren't entirely sure where it was. Um, then refound it on March six. Um, and and then it was one of these touch and go of of okay can we get the samples back um, yes they managed to get the samples back everything in the end worked but there was that lost it lost it oh there it is and so when people hear uh, complaints of NASA spending all of this time trying to get back communications with the lost mission. Um, no, sometimes it works. It's, it's actually worth having that poor sod at his computer sending the commands out to try and ping these spacecraft and see if they ping back. But it, it, there's a sort of a lot of similarity in my mind with the Apollo 13 story. Which you know, which is a you know human spaceflight story about this amazing rescue, but just that there was this never giving up on the spacecraft and just continually to kind of trim its mission back to just help it limp home, and in the end it was able to fulfill its its primary mission and return grains of asteroid material, uh, but it was just like it just Hayabusa did that. Apollo thirteen did not. Yeah, no, no, grains no. of asteroids. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Hayabusa, yeah, well, they just barely made it home, and it was just yeah. a great. It's a great story of just. I think, you know, for me, that's one of my favorites because it really just encapsulates this idea of just like never give up. What can we do? What can we work with with what yeah. we've got to modify this mission, to change its orbit, to, you know, like look at our environment. What can we work with? And, you know, and it was able to make it home. So I, th I thought that was, I thought it was great. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Apollo 13 really is the ultimate hack. Of yeah. Everything is broken. Take all the extra pieces you have on Earth, dump them on a table, figure out what the astronauts can do with those same pieces on the, on the, yeah. on the Apollo capsule. And, yeah, and, um, and, and yeah, it was an amazing story. And, and these are, these are some of my favorite stuff to report on, you know, when, when we find these little, like, I just love these clever ideas where people are like, oh, I know we can solve this catastrophic problem 
with this amazing solution that, you know, out of desperation or innovation or cleverness or whatever, yeah. and it just really shows the, the quality of the people that are working on these missions. I mean, and, kudos and I think, and my hats off to them. It, I think it really goes back to that core concept from Apollo 13 that failure is not an option. And what a lot of people we lose track of, especially um, people who grew up with any sort of affluency, I don't think you see this problem as much in the developing world of, well, if it breaks, you go get a new one. Um, it, if it breaks and it's too much effort to fix it, eh, you didn't really need it. But with spacecraft, you'll spend 10 years or longer trying to get permission to build that sucker. You'll go through several years to a decade of building it. It then flies through space for months at a time, in some cases for planetary spacecraft, years at a time if you're going to the outer planets, before it finally returns that first photo that makes it all worth it. Yeah. Failure is not an option. It's your entire career invested in that one moment, that one success. And there is no replacing a spacecraft. There is no replacing most of these telescopes, observatories, all the different things that we rely on as scientists. And so we have to fix things. We, we have to jury-rig things. We have to figure out who has enough chew chewing gum and matchsticks that we can MacGyver it to function. This is what we have. Um, we are a cash-strapped field. We get far, far less than 1% of the U.S. budget. Um, and we're trying to discover where did the universe come from and how will it all end. We're answering fundamental questions with shoestring budgets, using chewing gum uh, to, to hold things together. And failure isn't an option. And we've all adopted that spirit. And it, it's kind of awesome. Yeah, it's a good way to, to live your life too. So, uh, well, great. Well, thank you very much. That was a great inspirational finale to the, to the show. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye-bye. Now, don't go anywhere. We're just pausing recording. But we're not going to do a lot of questions, or I'm going to start eating my microphone because I haven't got much. Mm, microphone. <laughs> right. Um. Okay. Oh, export it. And the sparrows. Yeah, I I think Preston's going to give you a hard time about the sparrows. It's pretty loud. <laughs> he just got back from traveling through Europe. He went on a post-graduation trip. And, yeah. And, uh, hopefully he'll be nice and chill about it. He, he's going to enjoy his present when he gets back. <laughs> For like five, six episodes. Okay, Preston, get <laughs> to work. Get to work. Um... Uh, Michael Jobin notes the Voyager imaging drama. Uh, which I don't one's know that, that one. Yeah. Can you give us some more details, Michael? I mean, we were both very small children. This may be one that we simply weren't alive to be yeah, made aware of. Yeah. No. I mean, we had put we put Voyager on this just because it's continued to send back data from sort of the outer reaches of the solar system, well beyond I think any expectation. And you know, really now it's just a limitation of like whether or not they can communicate with the spacecraft. But yeah, if you can give us some more details, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so GeForce 833 says, how long will New Horizons work for? Any chance it can go to other Kuiper Belt objects after it's done with Pluto or will it just fly on the solar system? Yeah, so yeah. it actually, um, the problem that they're having is the Kuiper Belt is very, very empty. And so while they have enough fuel left over, assuming they don't have to do too much maneuvering due to the stuff that's discovered at Pluto, um, they should, in theory, have enough fuel, if they get the extended mission approval, to do um, a pair of maneuvering, um, I don't know, maneuvering... Exercise. Retargeting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they should be able to change their trajectory a couple of different times, which means that if they could find rocks in the right place or balls of ice, um, they could go visit them. But the problem that they're having is they're, they're still looking for things that have the right orbit that will carry them 
into the path of, of the mission on a reasonable time scale. Um, but yeah, so, so it will absolutely be continued to work. And it's, it's running an RTG as well, right? Yeah. So, so it'll, go, it'll last for decades, it's, it's a maneuvering fuel to go to Kuiper Belt objects. It's, it's really just great. traveling so fast. I mean, it's going, what, 68,000 kilometers? It's the fastest. Thing yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy stuff. fast. And so, you know, that's, you know, all the problems we had in communicating with Voyager are just going to get multiplied because it's, you know, yeah. way out there. Um, uh, M. Healy asks, how hard is it to put a Curiosity-sized rover on, say, Titan? Uh, I mean, it's, Titan's got a really thick atmosphere, so I would think that yeah, atmospheric landing, landing would be kind of reasonable. Yeah, it would be totally reasonable to land something. It's the fuel to get it out there that starts to become the issue. I don't think we've sent anything that heavy that far across the solar system. Cassini's the size of a school bus, so there's a yeah, spider that's true. on that's my true. microphone. <laughs> Hello. It's the day that all the life, well, livestock or life forms are yeah. are joining our episode. Um. Yeah. So. Oh. Uh. Yeah. So. So it. I mean. I guess. And it's just a matter of time. So. I wonder about the environment, though. Right. The Titan environment. How. How awful would that be on a on a it's rover? It's methane. Yeah. It's it's. It's cold though. So I mean, the, the whole heating problem is going to be. Yeah, is going to be the trick. Significantly. Yeah. Um, Hugo Burnham asks, on a similar theme, how long will MSL's plutonium battery last? I don't know. But I just, a long years. time. Yeah. Years. Years and years. Yeah. So, um, that spider, where's that spider? Okay. <laughs> All right. If that's your home now. Um, uh, James Haney says, are you sure it's not the government outside your window going cheap? Cheap? Uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah, that could be it. it could, could be it. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, Will, <laughs> Will Eyed Oni says, Fraser's going for the full GRRM look, I wonder. I, was it George R. R. Martin? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, you're much I, smaller than GR Martin. <laughs> I sometimes grow a beard and I sometimes don't. If you, it's just who knows. Sometimes I like a beard, sometimes I don't. Um, I think that's it. I think that's all the comments okay. and questions we've got. So, uh, yeah, and then we're gonna coordinate. Let's just see what's next, so people can know. I'm gonna look um, at my calendar. So, well, I have too many things open. Um, Let me see, yeah. um we we're recording Friday. Uh, so you don't see that thing in your calendar from 6 to 10? 6 to 10 in my calendar today is learning space. Oh, okay. All right. That's, that, that must be. It was scheduled as AC. Good. <laughs> Good. No, I'm, I'm all for this. Um, so Friday. Friday afternoon, yeah, so we're going to record another one on Friday afternoon. We've got the Weekly Space Hangout on Friday at, at noon, and then later on Friday afternoon we're going to do another one. So okay. I will post a, um, uh, I will post a, another event once we've decided on the topic and uh, decided on the, um, on the exact time. But it's going to be in the 3 to 6 range Pacific. So wh what do you like, yeah. 5? Okay, uh, it's still the same. So, so tentatively... What was that? 5 p.m. Pacific on Friday. Hmm? That's 7 p.m. here. I may have a husband who objects, so if maybe we can do it a little bit earlier. Four. I am at your that, disposal. Four. That that should be easier okay. to figure out. But I may have. Okay, so we're probably so it, time. <laughs> I will post it anyway. We're going to probably record Friday afternoon, sometime around 4 p.m. Pacific, give or take. So okay. if you see that. Event show up, then then there we go. Um, cool. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks Pamela for for this marathon, and we will see you. Um, we'll see you on Friday. Sounds good. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Awesome. All right.